Hi there everyone, Lars here with my review for Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, brought to you by Camille's Harem. Not just a podcast for novice writers by novice writers, but also a YouTube channel by novice writers for novice writers, because writing is an adventure, it's more fun with friends. And let's just really quickly get out of the way the experience of the movie before I start talking about the story and diving into, I think, some of the very important lessons that we can learn from what happened in this movie and what's actually playing out around the movie as well. So, full disclaimer, my experience in going to see this movie is different from what a lot of people have said where they went to empty movie theaters. I went to actually a really packed movie theater with kids, with really elderly people, and everyone in between. College students, parents, dating couples. There was a lot of people there at the movie theater. And a lot of them were really getting into the movie. Until we got to the end. And oh boy, you could feel feel the awkwardness in the room there were a couple of people who tried to get a standing ovation going for this movie no one got up everyone was silent some people i think even might have glared at them and they stopped they tried a second time and it didn't work out the way that this movie went i think is going to be divisive for those people who do watch it i have talked with some people who really enjoyed the movie and then there were others who as they left the movie theater were grumbling about everything that was wrong and me i left the theater feeling disappointed not even really angry just disappointed i did go in knowing all of the leaks because i've been keeping up with the stuff uh hashtag doomcock was right about everything <laughs> oh boy but i still went wanting to experience for myself what this movie would be like and the experience i had was disappointing disappointed now, I will say, I think the reason why I left the theater just feeling so deeply disappointed was that I saw throughout this movie the concepts and ideas and the bones of much better Indiana Jones movies. In fact, there are actually probably three different movies that could have been spun out of this one alone. The opening sequence is the climax to another Indiana Jones movie that we should have gotten. I would have loved to have gotten to know Basil. I feel like there was some real good chemistry between him and Indiana, and I would love to have seen what it would be like for them to chase the Spear of Destiny, uh, the, as it probably should have been called, the Spear of Destiny, the weapon that pierced the side of Jesus Christ, even though they call it the Lance of Lanjuis, something like that. It was, I was like, wait a second, I don't think I've ever heard that name for it before. Any case, that would have been a really neat one and set at the perfect time at the end of World War II. The Nazis are losing, Hitler needs a win, he needs the magical spear that pierced the side of Jesus Christ that makes the wielder invincible. And there's a whole lot that could have been done with that particular concept. There's a really great movie there. The opening sequence was a lot of fun. Was it Indiana Jones esque? Eh. Kinda. There's actually a lot of things that fit more into the realms of James Bond than Indiana Jones. And Indiana kept winning thanks more to dumb luck and comedy bits in that sequence than his pluckiness, his grit, his intelligence, and his strength. So, yeah, that was a little bit difficult to kind of swallow in a couple of moments. Still, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it for what it was, but it definitely wasn't the best Indiana sequence it could have been, and it ultimately was the climax to another movie that we never got. So, yeah, that's kind of disappointing to, to see the climax to a better movie that I'm never going to be able to watch. That kind of sucks. Then when we go into the rest of the movie, the things that just started becoming very disappointing was how the writers and editors and director didn't really seem to care. I will not say that for the actors. I will personally, I personally think that every actor and actress in this movie came in bringing their A game. You can tell that so many of them were enjoying themselves. Harrison Ford was doing his absolute best and I loved watching it. Mads Mikkelsen was awesome. Phoebe Waller Bridge. I think that she's actually a really great actress. The role that she was given was awful. Oh my gosh, Helena Shaw. If someone could have just put a bullet into the back of her head, this movie suddenly would have gotten way better. 
Uh, but that is not as not a dig against Phoebe Waller Bridge, who I think actually is a good actress. It's just good actress, horrible role, horrible writing. Uh, and then to waste the likes of John Rhys Davies, who just did such a wonderful job as Sala for two scenes. I was like, holy cow, we could have gotten that brilliant chemistry between him and Harrison Ford. We could have had that. And Antonio Banderas was just enjoying himself there on the screen. And really, even the extras just knew we are in an Indiana Jones movie. It's time for us to either act as those little plucky heroes on the side or as those devious, over-the-top villains that are just going to add to the body count. That was great to see. But speaking of body counts, another thing that really disappointed me in terms of laziness is that the bodies are inconsistent. No, seriously, throughout the entire movie, so many people die and then their bodies disappear. In fact, there's actually one scene where it's very important that one body should be right there. That body's not even there, and in fact, she's given a different wound later on when her corpse suddenly appears elsewhere. And I was like, wait, wait, what? How did this happen? When did this happen? The bodies are inconsistent. There's actually an entire scene where there should be a lot of bodies that Indiana has to kind of like waltz over because they're all they've all been shot either by him or by other people gone in the next shot and on and on top of that the day changes we go from twilight to noon in the span of five minutes in one scene and it was like whoosh. Did the editors not catch this when you guys went to the editing room? Who shot this? I want to know. It felt like the production crew was just not in on it. The set designers certainly were. The set designers were having a blast. But the, the cinematography felt lazy. It felt like they were doing their best to emulate stuff that Steven Spielberg and his cohorts have done in the past, but on a B-grade level. And... And why bother using the Wilhelm scream and changing it up all in the same? There was there's some really weird things that were going on, but that's all technical stuff. You're here though for the writing, because that's what Camille's harem brings. So what about the writing? I mean, there was a lot of things I said were just disappointing. It felt like there was a lot happening in the movie that for me was just lazy, despite the fact that the actors were all doing their absolute best. Well, again, here's where the disappointment stuff just comes on in. The dial of destiny itself, the clock made by the great, by the great mathematician Archimedes, the owl. <coughs> Educated owl. <laughs> <laughs> Say, that's a good one. <laughs> this clock right here makes no ding dang sense no matter what kind of way you try to hash this. Everything else throughout the entire Indiana Jones franchise, and yes, even those horrible crystal skulls, makes sense. But this clock does not. And all of the world-building rules that are used throughout, this, throughout the movie to explain said clock make no dang sense. Not at all. So I won't even bother recounting any of them because by the end of the movie, if you've been paying attention, you realize that none of it matters. So why did we waste all of these scenes talking about how this clock is supposed to work and how it's supposed to be brought together when it actually never mattered? None of it mattered. And sometimes it was flat out wrong. You know, sometimes it's okay to mislead your audience by feeding them something that the characters think is true and then to then reveal that it wasn't that way the whole time, that can be done really intelligently. But when you have all these characters spouting out all these facts like they've known it all their lives about this clock, then why is it that all of that ultimately is irrelevant? All, and it all leads to this reveal Spoilers, I guess. I don't mind spoiling this movie. It's already been spoiled by the uh, by everyone who's reviewed it since uh since the Canes whatever. Yeah, that whole film festival in France. Those French in their snooty ways. I could go on forever about the horribleness of French film, but whatever. But in any case, we are getting back on track. I'm going to try to get back on track anyway. The reveal at the end is that Archimedes the Owl has used the special device to make sure that people in the future could come to save him and the people of Syracuse from the Roman invaders. People should know when they're conquered. Stay with me. Wait.
wait a second here. Archimedes, you're so smart. How are people in the future supposed to get your clock? Your clock could be destroyed by the Romans. And how do you know that people in the future are going to be able to get up to that magical storm anyway that will allow them to get into the past? How on earth did you, without even understanding the meridian of time, which is something that... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that Indiana Jones brings up. This is one of the reasons why this doesn't make any sort of sense. Rule Rules for world building. If you establish something as fact, it should factor back on in. How did this guy know that he could bring people back to the siege of Syracuse if he wasn't able to compensate for the size of the earth, for the rotations of the earth, and the way that the calendars have constantly fluctuated? It makes no sense. So in any case, he somehow expects that people from the future will be able to come back with an army and with technology to rescue him from the Romans when the guy literally has sunbeam lasers to destroy the Romans. Yes, you've heard me right. He has sunbeam lasers to destroy the Romans, which we see him in the movie actively using to fend off the Roman armies. And he has these special weapons. And somehow the Romans have TNT. And how did all this technology get lost? At the beginning of the movie he, when Harrison Ford's character and Ian Jones is asking how do we know that any of this stuff happened what is the evidence there is no evidence for any of this stuff happening so apparently fantasy is now actual fact ah that's history that's not how history works. <laughs> oh really see where all of this is just coming off the rails and yes we've already seen this happen with Kingdom of the Crystal Skull and no, that is not a good excuse for being <laughs> dumb with your world building, with your history, and ultimately with your climax. The other three Indiana Jones movies were, to a certain extent, very well grounded in a sense of the occult, a sense of history, a sense of religion that you could fact check and find out that it's right. And for all the people who've been dumping on Temple of Doom, the thuggy were real. Oh, by golly, you want to actually have a look in the real to the real history of the thuggy? It is fascinating and horrifying. But yeah, so the world building, the explanations, none of it makes any sense for a reveal that is stupid the moment you stop to think about it. And a reveal that that shows that all this other stuff that was done or explained earlier in the movie didn't, never actually mattered. Another thing that I was just absolutely disappointed in was that I was expecting that Helena Shaw was going to be a competent character. She's not. If you actually pay attention through what's happening throughout the movie, she is a Mary Sue. Things just happen and work out for her the way that they are supposed to. But when you actually pay attention to the things that are happening around in the story, she's actually not a very knowledgeable person. She does have facts, facts about one thing, the Dial of Destiny. Beyond that, when you're paying attention to the movie, you realize that Helena Shaw is actually a really big idiot and a really big moron and a horrible person. And so the fact that she gets what she wants and that she comes off as the heroine and that Indiana Jones is indebted to her and all this stuff that everyone just seems to like her by the end. That's a Mary Sue character right there. Mary Sue's are lazy writing. So I was disappointed that I went through this whole movie just experiencing a main character who was a lazily written character. That was sad to see. And then Teddy, or the little knockoff for Short Round, was also just a lazily written character. And I think in part it's because Teddy's not given really anything to struggle against. Even when he gets captured by the Nazis, he's easily able to beat them and get his way on out there and take out the biggest Nazi thug of them all. Which, I mean, people are going to be like, yeah, woohoo, Teddy, you show them. Which, yeah, it's always nice to see Nazis get killed on screen. But when again, when you step back and you think about it, this is supposed to be our new generation's short round. He's nothing compared to the original short round who was very inventive, very clever, who was defeated multiple times and comes back to show that spirit, that spunk and that ingenuity that saves Indiana from being controlled and then leads to the great revolution that beats the thuggy within their own stronghold. That is an amazing moment there for a short round, which Teddy has only knockoff versions of that. And so that was kind of sad to see a character who could have been interesting get shortchanged that way to basically hand him wins, wins that weren't even earned. And now then, to address a criticism that I've heard from a lot of people that they're just these really long action set pieces, I am someone who loves action. 
I am someone who loves writing action. I wasn't quite so upset about all of the action set pieces. In fact, they were the highlights to the story. The problem is, is that these action set pieces were used more for transitions rather than for actually advancing the plot. Let's take, for example, what we actually see in the Raiders of the Lost Ark with the incredibly long action sequence of Indiana having to save Miriam and also retrieve the Ark of the Covenant from the Nazis. This is a very long action set piece with lots of death, lots of explosions, lots of gunfire, lots of driving, shooting, stabbing, the works. And why that scene works out so well is because we get to see Indiana at his best. We get to see him at his scrappiest. There's a lot of really great character development for Indiana in this particular moment, and we get to see him use everything and we see Miriam trying to help and everything showing off her own spunkiness her own autonomy which is very good for a female character and we get to see the resourcefulness of the Nazis and how the Nazis are a perfect foil to Indiana in this moment and how Belloc is also a great foil to Indiana because of how smug and how intelligent he's been and now he's suddenly caught on the back foot by Indiana so we have these two fencing each other through their moves through all the destruction that they they reek across Egypt. It is a really great scene right there because we get to see character conveyed through it. The one action set piece that really actually conveyed character was the whole Tuk Tuk chase, which was fun. I liked watching the Tuk Tuk chase. I actually really enjoyed it. But the problem was is that the characters that were introduced in that fight or the characterization that was introduced to us through that fight was annoying because Helena and Teddy were insufferable morons. And the movie tries to make it look like Indiana has no idea what he's doing and it's actually Indiana who manages to get them in a position where they could have gotten the Dial of Destiny away from Mad Mickelson's character. So it's there's a lot of stuff happening there that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It's like... It's like the story is fighting with itself to try to appease Kathleen Kennedy and to appease the Indiana Jones fans. And it just unfortunately falls apart. It's the only fight that actually introduces good characterization. An action moment, an action chapter, or an action sequence within a story can't just be about the flurry of movement. It needs to tell us something about these characters. It needs to help move the plot along in an intelligent way. If your fight doesn't do that, it can be really awesome, but chances are it will be easily forgotten. And the Indiana Jones sequence of chasing the Nazis to retrieve the Ark of the Covenant is one of the most iconic action sequences in cinematic history. And I can guarantee you this, that of the fight sequences from this particular movie, the one that, will have, that stands any chance of being remembered is the Tuk Tuk Chase. So yeah, here I am ranting about all of these things I just found disappointing. And I could go blow by blow by blow for all these things that just honestly didn't make sense. That was kind of lackluster. How they used comedy to undercut genuinely good emotional moments. How they didn't utilize characters the way that they should have. How they could have definitely trimmed things down and made it, made, made it way more streamlined and exciting. Ugh, man, there's so many things that could have been done to make this movie better. I will give them this. It was definitely not the first draft. <laughs> and the dialogue was actually good in quite a few instances. There was some good humor. There were plenty of instances where people laughed in the audience. So that was all good. Just that the ending was a literal slap across the face or a slug against the chin across the jaw that it left people just shocked and amazed and horrified like you're watching springtime for Hitler in Germany you're like wait that's the ending and that's why no one gave this a standing ovation when those three people tried to make it happen in the theater because the audience just wasn't feeling it when I went to go see this movie had the movie been done better and had not had such a stupid ending, then it probably would have gotten a standing ovation because the people were enjoying themselves while watching this movie. So I feel like that's a good place for me to transition on over to, I think, a very important conversation that needs to be had about the Dial of Destiny where it fits within the Indiana Jones canon. And this is something that I think is going to be very interesting to play out in the next decade to come. 
Here is something that you need to understand. This is coming from a person who is a historian. I'm a qualified historian. I have the degrees to back it up. <sighs> you don't get to define history. You can interpret history, but you don't get to define it. Nor does your control of history give you the power to determine the future. When people say that you want to learn history so that way you don't repeat the mistakes of the past, well, that's all nice and cool, but ultimately that is false. You can't actually do that. Understanding history does not give you a magical power to somehow carve out the future that you wish to have. And your control of how people understand the past does not give you control over future events. If that's the way it worked, then the whole 1984 scenario that we fear could happen would have happened a long time ago. No, instead, what we see playing out here is myth. In a previous video that I did earlier this year, I talked about how myth is a living thing. It is constantly changing based on the stories that are added, what people like, what they don't like, and what people pass on. When we think about the Indiana Jones franchise, it's been a common thing ever since the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull to discount it as a canon story for Indiana Jones. People like dragging it through the mud, and there's so many people who refuse to watch it or haven't watched it in over a decade. They don't want to return to it, and yet people love to return to Raiders of the Lost Ark, Temple of Doom, and The Last Crusade because those are movies that that people just love. And in fact, when you go back and you rewatch them, there's so much to enjoy within those movies. It makes sense that they've been passed down from generation to generation to generation. And why, when I went into the movie theater, I saw generations of people there to see an Indiana Jones movie. Because Indiana Jones, that character, that story, has been passed down. It is standing the test of time. Ten years from now, unless something really horrible happens to humanity, I expect to see Indiana Jones still a common topic of nerd culture, of conversation, and something that parents and grandparents are still passing on to their posterity. I absolutely expect to see that happen because it's been happening for so long now, and because those movies are so good. Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, however, the only thing that's really long-standing out of that is the whole topic of new the fridge <laughs> where things are so bad it, and so ridiculous it's even worse than jumping the shark and it's not just simply jumping the shark that ridiculousness has kind of subverted character and plot but nuking the fridge is so bad that you just can't get into the story anymore it's like the death knell to the story well king of the Scri uh, kingdom of the crystal skull did a lot of damage to the indiana jones franchise or at least how people regard if it can be continued and this is then where you have a lot of people stepping on in and saying no there aren't just three movies for indiana jones there's also that awesome television series which tells us more about the life of indiana jones and those, for those people, the myth of Indiana Jones is even bigger than those who just stick to three, four, or five Indiana Jones movies. So here we see that myth is living. People determine what they are going to pass on and what they accept as canon. And what I expect to see is that for the next couple of years, there will be a debate amongst fans about whether or not they are going to accept this Indiana Jones movie as canon. And because there are some people that I've talked to who have enjoyed this movie, yes, it will be passed on. Sorry guys, but the fact of the matter is that there are five Indiana Jones movies. Now, what we will see in 10 years time is this. Which of those five Indiana Jones movies will be remembered fondly and will be shown again and again and again to new generations? That will be what determines what is kept as the myth of Indiana Jones and what in time, in the space of time, or as one would say in German, in der Lauf der Zeit, will be remembered. And actually, as a quick little side note right here, I did enjoy how the movie had excellent German. If I didn't pay attention to the subtitles, I could understand just about everything. They even have crazy German dialects being spoken in the movie, which was a lot of fun to hear. I understood the dialects. I was like, sweet, I still got it. And then when I read the subtitles, I was like, almost half of these subtitles are incorrect based on what I'm hearing. Oh, and it actually changes the movie watching experience a little bit. That's just a fun little side note from Lars who can speak German. Schmetterling! 
you will get along beautifully in America. <laughs> But yeah, coming back to it, I personally think that this movie is going to be relocated to the dung heap of history. It will not be remembered fondly, unfortunately, for all the people who worked on it. It will not be a movie that is readily passed down from generation to generation. People will think about the first three Indiana Jones movies in a very positive light. And Kingdom of the Crystal Skull and the Dial of Destiny will not be remembered so fondly. And over time they will be discounted. And a good point of comparison would actually be some of the long-standing horror franchises, which have almost dozens of movies to them, or close to a dozen movies to them. Hey, we look at the Fast and the Furious franchise, phew, they're trying to beat The Land Before Time right there. There are so many movies within The Land Before Time, to The Fast and the Furious, to all different kinds of horror uh, franchises that are not very well remembered by anyone. They're not passed on except for those few people who do enjoy them and as a result people only remember the original friday the 13th and nightmare on elm street and maybe numbers two three and four uh and all people will only remember land before time movies one through three maybe or maybe only movies one and two fast and the furious franchise it all just blends together and it's all just one movie by now <laughs> myth is an interesting thing because it is memory it's what we share it's what we like and for Kathleen Kennedy, who tried to redefine so much of George Lucas's stories in her own image, it, it's not going to stick. When people say that this is the death of the legacy of Lucasfilm, and it is the death of the legacy of Harrison Ford, and it is the death of the legacy of Indiana Jones, that's just a bunch of clickbait nonsense. It's, that's not how it's going to play out. Not at all, because that's not what we've seen historically. Now then, 10 years from now might prove me wrong, but I feel fairly confident in this pattern that I've observed through, by looking at cinematic history right here. Instead, it is the legacy of current day Disney, is the legacy of Kathleen Kennedy, is the legacy of people like James Mangold who thought that they could put their stamp on this myth and claim it for their own. And this is something that I feel like many novice authors really need to take to heart. Yes, it is so easy to write fan fiction. <laughs> Even if it's not great fan fiction, it's so easy to write fan fiction. It's so easy to insert ourselves into these stories that we like. It's so easy to create knockoffs of things that have inspired us. However, those stories are not very readily remembered. They are usually forgotten, even by the people who create them, sometimes very willingly forgotten. If you want to make a story that actually stands a good chance of having a real positive impact on your audiences, you want to strive to be creative and tell your stories. Not just play around in someone else's myth, but go through the process of creating your own stories, which, if they're beloved, will eventually start becoming someone else's myth. And that is a cool way to become, Im to become immortal within the long run of human history. Well, I think I'm going to stop now before I start waxing way too eloquent than is appropriate for talking about Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. And I leave it to you to watch this movie if you wish and tell me your thoughts about it. These have been mine. Like I said, there's those people who disagree with me and they're totally free to do so. And we'll see in 10 years' time what my predictions have to say. Hopefully Camille's harem is around for another 10 years, so that way I can follow up on this. And that might actually be rather interesting to do. If you want to make sure that we have 10 years of time to follow up on my predictions, then please make sure that you've subscribed to Camille's harem. And please support us by checking out the books that we ourselves have published. They are in the description below. Give us your reviews. Tell us what you think about them. And otherwise, thank you for joining us on this adventure that we call writing, and until the next video, y'all, choose.